At this time, we're gonna receive our tithes and offerings. As I was thinking about this very first day of the year, how great is it that not only do we get to uh, worship together virtually online, we're gonna have 21 days of prayer and fasting to start our year off. We also get to give the Lord the first fruits of our labor on this very first day of the year. And so let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessing over this offering and over this year. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in 2022. Uh, we thank you in advance for what you will provide and for who you are in 2023. Thank you, Lord, that you already have gone into this year before us and you've provided a way for the church and for each person that's a part of our church family. Lord, I pray your blessing over anyone this morning that may be really struggling financially, that needs uh, your touch and your help in the area of finances. We pray, Lord, that you'd be strong on their behalf. And Lord, we faithfully and we um, cheerfully bring our offering to you this morning. We ask you to bless it and use it to reach people all over the world. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Good morning and welcome to LifeHouse Online. We're so glad you've decided to join us today. If you have any questions, please comment down below to chat with our online host. Now, here are some upcoming announcements. Are you new around here and looking to get connected at LifeHouse? Start with newcomers. Newcomers is a great way to get to know Pastor Ryan and Kelly Coffey and hear more about the heart and values of our church. Join us on January 29th after second service. If you've already been through Newcomers, your second step is Connection, which will be held following services on February 5th. Lunch and childcare will be provided. Just let us know you're coming by registering online at lifehousesa.com. We're so excited to meet you. 
Whether you are a new believer or have been following Jesus for years, our Essentials class gives you the opportunity to step deeper into learning the essential practices of our faith. This class will teach you how to strengthen your walk with the Lord by learning to put into practice the disciplines of prayer, Bible study, worship, giving, and cooperating with the Holy Spirit. This class will begin January 15th and will be provided in English and in Spanish at 9.15 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We look forward to seeing you there, so be sure to register online at LifehouseSA.com. online at lifehousesa.com so that, dang it, dang it, I was so close! Wow! Okay. Dang it! So close. Dang, I was so close! Blah, 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 blah. First up, homemaker, Claudia. <laughs> it's like, Next Sunday on September 20th. We will be meeting on September 25th from. Let us know by Elin. That! Email on. This cookie exchange if your sweet tooth des <laughs> sweet tooth desires. <sighs> Jacob's like, I could put anything behind you. <laughs> Surfing, dude. Hang ten. <laughs> Where should I look? Where's the camera actually it's at? Right okay, because I've been kind of looking for the camera. No, it's, okay, it's right okay, that that really helps me. No matter, oh, I caught my thumb on the strap. Here we go. Lifehouse Kids wants you to, I'm gonna start again. LH Youth. Can I do that? LH Youth. Okay. You're like, I'm not gonna use it, but sure. And looking to get connected here at the Lifehouse, at the Lifehouse. At the Life House. My goodness, Aaron. Wouldn't be a filming without a fart. I hope this isn't like messing with the microphone. It's our new ministry for young adults, for young people! <sighs> young people, young people, young people. Young persons. Young people, young people, young people. Should we destroy it? No, please don't kill me. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> it was good. It sounded just like it. We're losing our flame. Yeah, 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 yeah. A bit on a parking spot and say, Hey, I'm walking here. Get out the walkway. I don't think they do this. This is something else. It's not. It's not. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Laser eyes. But can you just like do like a freeze frame and so I can have like lasers coming from my eyes? Okay, boss. Uh, I need your sides ready for this Sunday. So, dang, dang it, I hate filming myself. <laughs> well, what did you want me to say, boss? Uh, yes, boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh. 
Oh, gosh. Connection number two. Jacob always makes a connection with his number two. <laughs> you heard it. You heard it. I got to get my poop humor out somewhere. There's got to be one. There's got to be one or two. <laughs> OK, OK, OK. Hey everyone, happy new year. It's hard to believe that today marks the beginning of 2023. To be honest, it kind of feels like we've been stuck in 2020 for the past two years, kind of like we've stalled out. Uh, it reminds me of a story uh, of the Rose Parade that takes place every New Year's Day uh, in Pasadena, California. Well, almost every New Year's Day. Because if you were hoping to watch it today, uh, you were greatly disappointed because you will discover that they have a never on Sunday rule. The never on Sunday rule was instituted in 1893. And when I first found out about this rule, I was super excited about it because I thought, man, they don't want to interfere with church. They wanted to, to, to not compete with church. But then I discovered that that's not really why they have a never on Sunday rule. It turns out it was first instituted so as to not spook the horses outside the churches along the parade route. This is going to be the 20th time that they've had to invoke this rule. And my hope is that tomorrow when you watch it, you might watch it with a little bit of a, uh, maybe a, a little bit of a different perspective. But I want to tell you a story because I, I, I've had the opportunity to go. Uh, I've had the opportunity to see the floats as they're being built. And, and if you don't know what the rule is with these floats, and this is why I kind of like it, is because of the attention to detail and the creativity. Because all of the surfaces of the floats, the framework, it must be uh, covered in a natural material. It's got to be covered with things like flowers or plants or seaweed, seeds, bark, vegetables, all those kinds of things, even nuts. And, and no artificial flowers or plants are allowed on the floats. And in fact, the materials themselves, they can't be artificially colored. You, you can't even take the flowers and uh, change the color of them. They all have to be very natural. It's really a, a pretty amazing sight. Um, one year, there was a float that was driven by a guy named Mark Bevan. He was a 15 and a half year old uh, kid. He just got his learner's permit. He was asked to drive one of the floats. Uh, and so he's driving the float. It was, uh, the, the float was presented by a company called Standard Oil Company. It was covered with American Beauty roses. It was really this beautiful float. But right in the middle of the parade, the float ran out of gas. It, it stopped right in the middle of the route until someone could go and get some gas. The irony, of course, is that it was the standard oil company's float, which is now known as Exxon, right? If there was, if there was one float that should not have run out of gas, it was that one. It was the gas float. They should have had plenty of gas. 
Well, I tell you that story because I don't know about you, but the story reminds me of me sometimes. I'm following Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm on the route with Jesus, and sometimes it just feels like I'm out of gas. And, and as we transition into this new year, I, I really want us to, I want to be reminded that although it may be a new year, we have the same God. Hebrews reminds us that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that no matter how many years you are celebrating today, we have the same God. No matter how depleted and empty you might feel. For some of you, you might even find yourself kind of uh, limping into the new year. And honestly, there might even be some who are just like kind of at the end. They just want to give up. And I've got good news and I've got bad news for you if that's you. The bad news is that the Christian life, this life that we've decided to live as Christ followers, it's impossible. It's impossible. You, you can't do it on your own power. We are just not good enough on our own. But there's good news. And the good news is that God provides power. The Holy Spirit is God's presence and power with us. You never need to run out of gas again. You never need to limp into the new year again. In some of his last words to his followers before he ascended into heaven, Jesus gave this promise in uh, the book of Acts, in chapter 1, verse 8. I want to read it for you. It says, You will receive power When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The koine or the common Greek term used here in the ancient text for the word translated as power is the term dynamite. It's our modern English derivative uh, of the word dynamite. It's in the original language, the, the word meant power to achieve something, specifically by applying divine abilities to the endeavor. What God is telling us is that there's much we can do in his power that we cannot do in our own strength. And I can't imagine what it must have been like is, uh, or, or what was going through the minds of the executives of the Standard Oil Company as they're watching their float go through the parade route and, uh, and, and all of a sudden it just stop, right? They've got this large, beautiful, impressive float that they just couldn't budge even an inch and yet with the application of just a gallon of gas, it could easily have been moved forward for quite some distance. In a similar way, the Lord has promised us his power. And yet while his power is available to us, it's not automatic. Over the next many weeks, we're gonna unpack the book of Acts. I I want to inspire us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to, to expect that God is going to empower us to work in us and and through us, that I want us at at LifeHouse to discover the key to uh, the expansion of the early church. My hope is that each week as we leave from this place, as uh, as we go about our week and we go into our life circle, is that we will leave hungry for more, more of God's spirit, more of his power and, and love, a, a desire to accept that what God did in the early church is actually available to us today. It's a new year. We, we all are looking forward to setting new year resolutions and, and, and changing things about our life. But the one thing that is unchangeable this year, it is a new year, but he is the same God. He is unchangeable. His power is unchangeable. It is available to us. And friends, there is more. There's more to God than what you know 
There's more to God than what you have experienced so far. I can say confidently that that no matter where you're at spiritually, you might be a brand new Christian. And I would just say to you, friends, there's more. There's lots more. You might be a a seasoned veteran. You've put, you know, a lot of miles on your spiritual car, so to speak. Guess what? There's, There's more. There's lots more. The, the same power that raised Christ from the, from the grave is available to us. God, in his, God is infinite. God is uh, eternal. And so there's always more of him to be experienced. When I was a kid, I uh, had the privilege to be able to go to the Oregon coast. And, and one of my favorite things to do was to play around in the tide pools. I, I was fascinated by them. I would find uh, little creatures and, and I, would, I would use sticks and I would play with them. And I would see things swimming around in there, things attached to the rocks. And, and, and it was just this amazing thing. It was almost as if... Um, I didn't realize that there was a whole ocean of things. And is it that true that sometimes we're like children in a tide pool thinking that it's the whole ocean? We think that, that what we are currently experiencing or, or what we have experienced is the whole thing. And friends, I just want to remind you as we go into this new year, it's not. It's not the whole thing. There's more. There's lots more. And as we get into the book of Acts, which, to be honest, really should be titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit, we're going to talk about the baptism and the fullness of the Spirit. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to uh, I'm going to do my best to explain the, the theological positions that are held by Christians. In fact, wh- when it comes to our theology of the Holy Spirit, I think and, and believe that the correct posture for every Christian is simply to want more, because there is more. Jesus compared the Holy Spirit to a few different things. Jesus compared the Holy Spirit to living water, to wind, to fire. He, he, the Holy Spirit's also referred to as a dove. And, and much like water and wind and fire and doves, the truth is, is that we will never be able to contain him. He, he's bigger than our theologies. Next week, as we kind of kick off the series, I'm introducing it this week, but we're going to kick it off next week. I'm going to start the series by introducing you to the promise of power that has been given to us and available to us today. But I want to give you some scriptures that that kind of give us the picture of these illustrations of the Holy Spirit of water and wind and fire and a dove. I'm just going to kind of read through them and I want you to pick up on the the analogies of the Holy Spirit here. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, it says, I baptize... I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting, They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 through 17 says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, Whom I have loved, with him I am well pleased. Jesus is baptized. The the Spirit descends like a dove upon him, and the Father speaks from heaven. Notice how the Spirit is portrayed. It's portrayed as a dove descending and landing on Jesus. 
And so in all of these scriptures, you see this different analogy used. You see fire, you see wind, you see a dove. And and now I want us to look at John chapter 3, where uh, Nicodemus comes to visit Jesus. And it says, uh, in John chapter 3, verse 3 through 8, it says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus teaches the necessity of being born again. Not a physical rebirth, but this spiritual rebirth. We must be born of the Spirit. And then he uses a metaphor and I don't know if you picked up on it, but it was, what, the, the wind. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You, you hear the sound of the wind, right? Does that remind you of anything, of, uh, of when they were in the upper room and a, and a mighty rushing wind? But, but, but you, you can't tell where it comes from. You can't tell where it's going. The spirit is like wind, the spirit's like fire, the spirit's like a dove, In the next passage, Jesus speaks at the temple in Jerusalem during one of the great Jewish feasts, the the Festival of Tabernacles. And one of the ceremonies that week took place at at the great altar. A a priest would would be at the altar, he would fill a pitcher of water and and he would pour it out at the, the base of the altar while people recited Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, which says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. It was kind of this elaborate ceremony that combined thanksgiving for water and a, and a prayer for rain and, and commemorated the, like water coming from the rock in the wilderness to satisfy Israel's thirst. It, it was against this backdrop that Jesus, in John chapter 7, verse 37, says, on the last day, and the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus had not yet ascended to the Father. Friends, are you thirsty? Are you, are you thirsty? Are you coming into this new year and you're just thirsty for more? Keep coming to Jesus, keep drinking. Rivers of living water will flow from you. What what was Jesus talking about? John tells us that that by by this he meant the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be a river of living water flowing out of you. Living water was running water. A, A river is living water. A stream is living water. A puddle is not living water. And friends, Jesus promises us rivers, not puddles. The Holy Spirit is a river of living water flowing from within us. The Holy Spirit is represented by living or running water, by blowing wind, by burning fire, by a descending dove. And all of those things have something in common. They all have something in common. They are all wild and free. I don't mean wild as in crazy. I mean wild as in not tamed, not domesticated, 
not controlled or contained by us. I think Jesus chose these metaphors carefully so that we would remember that the Holy Spirit is God. He is untamable. He is wild and free. If, if you contain fire, if, if you were to cover a flame, it goes out. And, and sometimes our theologies, I think, have tried to contain the Holy Spirit, to answer every question, to solve every riddle. And usually when we do that, our fire goes out, but a new fire breaks out in, in someone else. If the wind is blowing through your house and you shut all of the, the doors and all of the windows, the wind doesn't stop blowing. It's, it's still blowing. It's just not blowing on you anymore. And sometimes our, our theologies seem to close the doors and shut the windows and the wind is still blowing. It's just not blowing on us anymore. If you were to go to a, a stream, to a creek or a river, and, and you were to scoop up some water in your hydro flask, you have water, but it's, it's no longer living water. It's not running water anymore. And sometimes our theologies, they try to bottle the Holy Spirit up, and, and we end up with something less than living water. If you were to try to catch a dove, right, it's just it's going to fly away. And sometimes our theologies have seemed to make the Holy Spirit this commodity that we can control and predict and domesticate. And when we do that, he seems to fly away. And oftentimes what we see is he lands on someone else. We have to try to understand him, but we also must remember that he is always bigger than our understanding. Friends, I'm not... I am not arguing for an anything goes theology when it comes to the Holy Spirit. I just am not. We are, we are bound by the scripture. So anything contrary to scripture has to be rejected. And we know that he is the spirit of Jesus. So anything unlike Jesus is not the spirit. We must have a biblical theology of the Holy Spirit but we also must remember that he is much bigger than our theology. If we don't, we're just going to be like a bunch of children playing in a tide pool and thinking it's the ocean, or, or we're going to be driving along our spiritual parade route of our life, and, and all of a sudden, it's just we're just going to stall out. We're just going to run out of gas. The truth is, is that there's more. And as we get into this series of the book of Acts, I'm going to unpack these major theological positions on the Holy Spirit. And, and, and by the way, I kind of think that they're all right, and yet I think they're all too small, and I think they're all incomplete. They're like, a, a, they're like the blind men feeling an elephant and describing it, right? One felt a tusk, said the elephant is like a, a spear. One felt the, the trunk, and they said the elephant was like a snake. Another felt the, the leg and said it's like a tree. Another blind man felt its side and said, well, it's, it's a wall, right? Another felt its tail and said, well, it's, it's a rope. Another felt its ear and said, it's, no, it's a fan. They were all right, and yet they were all incomplete. There's more to the elephant than what any one of them or even what all of them together experience. It seems to me that every major theological position on the Holy Spirit is missing something or ignoring some scripture or missing some experience or perspective. They've each latched on to something that is true, but they've missed out on other things. And as soon as you think that you have it figured out, as soon as you, you think that you've got every question answered, every mystery solved, friends, that's when I think we're in trouble. And that goes for me too. Next week, we're also kicking off 21 days of prayer and fasting as we give God the first of our year. People ask me, well, why do we have to commit 21 days to fasting? Like, why, why do we have to fast? And if you don't know what fasting is, it's the, 
It's the removal of something in your life to remind you to step into prayer and to step into and be reminded of your dependency on him for your life. The goal of fasting is to draw near to God. It's it kind of hits the reset button of our soul and it renews us from the inside out. Fasting enables us to, to celebrate the goodness and the mercy of God. It, it prepares our, our hearts for all of the good things that God desires to bring into our lives. And when deciding on a fast, this is my encouragement to you. I, I hope that we will all do this together, but when you're deciding on a fast, uh, uh, my encouragement is that you seek God in prayer, you follow what the Holy Spirit leads you to do, and, and some people will use different type of uh, fast. There's some that will use food fast, like the Daniel fast or the Jewish fast, or others choose a media fast from social media or watching Netflix or TV, wh whatever the case. It, it really is less about the type of fast as much as it is about emptying yourself of something that consumes you and, and honestly spending the next 21 days focused on your relationship with God is one of the greatest things that you can do. I, when I first got an iPhone, I, I was leaving it plugged in all the time, right? I was making sure that it was always charged because I never wanted it to die, I needed it available at all times. What happened was eventually my phone wouldn't hold a charge. I don't know if you know this, but uh, there is such thing as battery health on your phone. That is super important for you to actually let your battery be completely emptied before you charge it back up. You, you have to empty it in order for it to be able to be full. And friends, that's what fasting is. It's an emptying of yourself in order for you to experience the fullness that he promised. So many Christians have reduced the Christian life to this daily struggle to manage their sin. And I just want to tell you, as we go into this new year, the gospel isn't about you trying to manage your sin. It's about you enjoying the very life of God. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life to the full. Jesus wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit, the life of God, and then he wants you to live that life to the full. Jesus didn't die to make you more religious. He didn't die to, to make he, he didn't die to make you better church attenders or to better manage your sin. He died to make you more alive. There is more. He wants you to be filled. I believe that the proper posture for every Christian is to just simply want more. Always. There's more. There's more to God than what you've experienced. He is the same God that opened up the oceans for the Israelites. He is the same God that made a shepherd boy courageous. Friends, we stand on the faithfulness of God that led the early church in the advancement of his kingdom. He's still doing it today. There's more available, more of his power, more of his love, more of his wisdom, more of his peace, more of his joy, and more of his life. There's more of him. And I don't know about you, but as I go into this next year, I want more. And I hope you do too. I want more to this life than just existing, just managing. My hope and my prayer for all of us is that we would experience more of him. The one that healed, we need we need him to heal again today. The one that saves, we need him to save us again. As I close in prayer, our worship team's gonna end after I'm done here in our prayer. The worship team's gonna end with really what's going to be the theme song 
for this series, and it's called Same God. Though we are going into a new year, and yet he is the same God, he still provides the same power that's available to us. Will you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful for life. We are grateful for a new year. We are grateful that you have given us a beautiful opportunity to experience more. God, no matter where people are at in their relationship with you today, that as they go with us as a faith community into 2023, as we go into this new year, God, my prayer is that they would experience more of you, more of your power, more of your love, more of your life. And God, that we would be a faith community, a people of, uh, of faith that follow you and follow your ways, the desire, the gifts, and desire to be filled again and again and again with more of you, and that we would advance your kingdom in this world, that we would be a church that isn't just about coming and learning and, and, and filling our minds with information, but we would be a people who walk out the doors of Lifehouse Church and we go into our life circles with the expectation that you are going to move and work through us and in us. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love and mercies over us. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name, amen.